Welcome to the second episode, the difficult second episode of the Cosmic Shed. I'm Andrew and with me today are Laura and Ben. We are going to talk about the imitation game today, but before we do, some very exciting news. We have had our first subscriber. Woo! I'm hoping we've got more than one, but I just know that we had our mm-hmm. first one. And he's called Achintia. He works for the CMS experiment at CERN and the Large Hadron Collider. That's a pretty cool first subscriber. Hello, Achintia. Hello. Hi. We've set the bar high. <laughs> yes, that's <laughs> pretty good. Today we are talking about the imitation game, which is the new biopic. Is that how we say it? Biopic? Biopic? Biopic sounds a bit like myopic, um, <laughs> which... No, I'm not going to go there. Let's say <laughs> biopic. Okay. Biopic. Is that the same that? as biofilm, or is that something else? I don't know. Bio, that's I definitely don't... a biological term. But well, that's science Maybe we could do one of those. Yeah. Maybe that could be the next episode of Biofilm. Okay, this is the Alan yeah. Turing Biofilm. Biofilm. I've heard it described as an American-British historical thriller. Oh, I feel that really, sounds yeah. good. That's punchy. It's dramatic. Uh, anyway, it's all about Alan Turing, and it stars Benedict Cumberbatch, who we do have an interview with. I had an opportunity to speak to him before I saw the film, and I asked him what had attracted him to the role of Alan Turing. A really fast-paced, witty incredibly involving and deeply moving script it read like a thriller like a love story and you feel you're discovering him and what he was at the same time as his puzzle and unraveling apologies for the sound i hope it's clear enough uh, i was speaking to him on the phone obviously he's a very busy man as i say i hadn't seen the film at that point i was very excited to see the film i should just say there's going to be spoilers we will be talking about the entire plot Yes. of the imitation game. We will be spoiling some aspects of real life <laughs> um, and how how the film relates to real life. Yes. So, yeah. A lot yes. of spoilers this episode. If you, episode. if you don't already know about Alan Turing, we're going to spoil that by telling you a bit about him. There's also going to be a poem. Should we do the poem? Right. I feel we need a jingle at the start of this. <laughs> Should we make one up? Yeah. <clears throat> poem, poem, it's been poem. Poem, poem. That was your cue. <laughs> <laughs> it's been spoiled. All right. We rehearsed then. <laughs> you can see. Last week we had a haiku, a Japanese poem. Uh, this week uh, Andrew has asked me to write the, the poem for the imitation game in the form of a shijo, which is a traditional Korean form of poetry uh, with three lines, each of around 14 to 16 syllables. Okay. In testing times... He deciphers, resplendent in enigmatic tweed. His brain clicks round, four up, two down. His appeal, not universal. An odd duck, a good egg, a bad apple, a silent death. Thanks, Ben. So the imitation game looks at the life of Alan Turing uh, from three different points in his life, three different times in his life. I really loved the film, not just because of it spreading the word of Alan Turing's work and life and, and getting that message to more people, but as a film in itself, I think it's it's a brilliant drama, uh, beautifully acted. It drives forward really well. It sort of takes you on on the journey and as... As Benedict says in the interview, it you feel like you're discovering him as he's cracking the code. Ben, what uh, what were your expectations going into it? You could tell from the trailers it was going to be quite a populist, entertaining film. It was directed by Morton Tildum, who previously directed Headhunter, which is it was a really enjoyable, um, quite dark thriller. So I was intrigued by that. The cast really interesting. Um, I really enjoy Matthew Good. He was absolutely fantastic in uh, Stoker, if you haven't seen Stoker. That is a fantastic film. That's a fantastic... Uh, that's, yeah. yeah. You definitely need to watch that. Yeah, and obviously I've enjoyed Benedict Cumberbatch in loads of stuff. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. recently Parade's End. Really beautiful performance in that. Really layered. Just so much going on. I was, I was looking forward to it. I really, really enjoyed the film. I really did. And I was completely swept along with 
Alan Turing's character and I felt that was portrayed really nicely. I think the relationship between Joan Clark and Alan Turing is portrayed really movingly in the film by Benedict Cumberbatch and Keira Knightley. I think that's really one of the strengths of the film. Lots of good character actors in the background. Bletchley Park looks fantastic. And obviously it's really important that the story of Alan Turing is, is getting out to a wider audience. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's pretty much a stated aim of the film is to get the story out there, to get a populist film to attract a wide audience and get Alan's story out there. I did ask Benedict how much he knew about Alan Turing before taking on the role. To the majority of people, he's not that well known. No. Um, and, you know, I, I have to my mind that and say the same. You know, the more I discover about this man, as I read about him, as I played him and researched him, mm. You know, he should be on the front cover of textbooks. He should be on banknotes. He should be one of celebrated as one of our national heroes. He certainly should be held up to Darwin and yeah. uh, and Isaac Newton. I left the film wondering why I didn't know the story in full. Right. I, yeah. yeah. And yeah. I felt like I should have known the story in full before going in. Yeah. And you, Ben? I felt that I knew a bit about uh, Alan Turing's life and a little bit about his work. I went to university in Manchester and. I remember sort of reading about his life. There's a statue of Alan Turing in a park in Manchester. There's been a road named after him. I'd heard a really great episode of Radio Lab, which is about his life and links into the Turing test, how that developed. Mm -hmm. So I guess I had some background, not yeah. loads yeah. at all, not by any means, but he was a figure that I was, I was aware of. After the war, uh, Alan Turing worked at Manchester University doing his research there. And it was actually in Manchester that he died or committed suicide. I'm from Manchester. Yes. As you can tell from my strong Mancunian accent. But <laughs> I didn't know anything at all about Alan Turing going through school. I left school in 1994. The road name was changed in 1994 to Alan Turing Way. And okay. that was the first time that I'd ever asked the question, who's Alan Turing? Why have they why, changed? Yeah. Why is there a name? And why obviously that's why they changed the road name. But 1994 is quite a long time after Alan Turing died. Yeah. yeah. And that story, as somebody born and bred in Manchester myself, I should have known his story. It should be embedded in the psyche of everyone in Manchester, but not just Manchester, the world. Alan Turing is widely celebrated as the father of modern computing. Mm -hmm. If you're listening to this podcast, arguably... It might never have happened if it wasn't for him. And his kind of big breakthrough was the concept of the universal machine. Mm. So before then, from Charles Babbage onwards, people were thinking of, of machines that would do calculations, that would make, that would simplify maths. And Turing conceptualised the idea of a universal machine that could do pretty much everything. It didn't have to be programmed in one way. It could turn itself to any problem. And, yeah, the way he conceptualised that was an infinite piece of tape with zeros and ones that could then be programmed to perform any task. And that, that was the universal machine. There were other people working on the idea of computers, but it was that that then led to our modern concept of a computer as something programmable, as something digital that could, that, that could adapt. He's also thought of as the father of artificial intelligence. Is that fair? Well, he designed an experiment that's nowadays known as the Turing test. This is an attempt to find whether a machine is intelligent or not. He wanted to develop a machine that could, in turn, learn as well. It could develop and it could learn. This was something that he was fascinated by. Can a machine recreate the process of the brain? Are, are our brains basically machines? And can we then recreate um, a complex enough machine that it can, it can do everything that a human brain can? Now it happens every year that people submit their their AI um, programs to find whether a machine can fool a human into thinking it's intelligent. There, there have been a couple of occasions where at least it's been proposed that uh, a machine has fooled the judges. There was one in June of this year, actually. I believe that it fooled the judges to um, think it was a 15-year-old boy or something which doesn't seem quite the spirit of the, uh, <laughs> the endeavour. Mm. Turing's idea is based on an old parlour game where um, a man and a woman would go into a separate room and answer questions, and then a judge had to guess who was the man and who was the woman from the 
from the questions. That's yeah. a really nice way of visualising <laughs> yeah. such a complex. <laughs> yeah. uh, when I was talking to Benedict, actually, he had quite an interesting take on Turing's work on artificial intelligence. His entire work was almost about that. It was almost about the differentiation between the real and the artificial and how we've constructed a world by which, you know, we can actually, we have to struggle to tell the difference because we have empiricized ourselves. Yeah. He wanted to have something that was um, provably um, as good as human, but made through maths and logic mm. to debunk the idea that there was some kind of magic at the core of everything. You know, the spiritual for him was attainable through uh, logic, through the beauty of the wonder of what we were capable of, what logic was capable of. I've never ever heard a good definition of the word spirituality, but if it means a, a joy and a sense of wonder yeah and awe about something and if if that's what it means and that's what Joring got from science and logic and mathematics then I think that's something that well it's certainly something that I can relate to and I think there's an interesting question there are we as human beings just machines are we biological machines is everything we experience just a chemical reaction in our brain are we just under the impression that our, we're in control of our emotions and our beliefs, or are they completely worthless? You'd like to think that we're more than just a machine. You would like to think that we have a, more of a, a purpose and a meaning, and that we're not just so clinically interacting with each other. We are a product of our environment and the influences we've had since we were born. But I think there's so much more than just being um, a series of... Um, reactions caused by stimuli, caused by um, other people interacting with you. And I think that um, if you have the capacity of having morals and good and bad and the ability to learn, we can love. We have friendships, we have emotions, we have morals, we understand the good and the bad. And I think that saying we are just machines is a very clinical way, very simplified way of looking at it. I don't think we're just machines. We're universal machines. We're universal. <laughs> we are universal machines. We have an infinitely long piece of tape inside us. <laughs> if everything that we are is a function of our bodies, it's an incredible thing. And the science would suggest that we are a function of our brains. When people have serious brain traumas, they lose parts of their personality, or their entire personality, or their sense of self which suggests very strongly that the sense of self is a function of the organ of the brain. And I think that in no way does that make life worthless. It takes no magic away from life. It just makes it more interesting. There's not just the Turing test for artificial intelligence. For example, there's also the Ada Lovelace exam, which looks at whether an artificial intelligence can create um, an artistic artefact whether it's a story or music, it doesn't have to be good, necessarily, but it has to fool people into thinking that a person could have created it. So that's Almost like real art. Then. Almost like real art. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and, has, and has anybody passed the t Has any, anybody, has any, <laughs> any computer passed the test? As with the, the Turing test itself, that's still, still being worked on. Okay. But we're actually, we've just finished Nano Genmo. Go on. <laughs> Nano Genmo. Yeah. Who's she? is National Novel Generation Month. Oh. Which, of ah. course, NaNoGenmo comes from NaNoWriMo. Of course it does. Yeah. National Novel Writing Month, where people people write novels in a month. But um, National Novel Generation Month is a new... I think it started last year. Um, people who are interested in creating artificial intelligences, writing programmes, set them the task of, of writing novels. So far, that's resulted in kind of adaptations of older books, but with Twitter-style dialogue kind of laid on top of them. It hasn't quite fooled anyone yet, but no. yeah. it's on its way. It, it's quite a compelling idea, isn't it, that Turing believed quite firmly that one day machines would think in the same way that human beings did. But he also proposed that idea almost as a, as a carrot... For, for other computer scientists, although they didn't exist or certainly weren't called that then, to s strive for that, and that would take us to places that um, 
that maybe we didn't imagine before. Yeah, a challenge <laughs> yeah. to other researchers. And it, it's certainly something that comes up a lot, a lot in sci-fi, doesn't it? I mean, immediately Blade Runner springs to mind for me. There have been a number of uh, portrayals of Alan Turing, stage and screen and books. Most influentially, I think, was uh, Breaking the Code, which was a play by Hugh Whitemore. It was made into a BBC film in 1996 with Derek Jacobi in the lead role. Um, that itself was based on a very influential biography by Andrew Hodges called Alan Turing, The Enigma, which first came out in 1983. There's been several other stage, stage versions, a play called Love Song for the Electric Bear, um, a musical called The Universal Machine, which came out last year. And, of course, the Pet Shop Boys have created a musical biography of Alan Turing called A Man from the Future. There was a really good episode of Horizon from the 90s, which I found on YouTube. Maybe it's still up there. I wouldn't want to recommend that, but <laughs> it's there. Breaking the Code, the, the BBC play is also, or was, also on YouTube. There was a Channel 4 documentary about all of the, the code breakers at Bletchley Park. Uh, called Station X. And Alan Turing has turned up in, yeah, in lots of books. Uh, there's a novel called Cryptonomicon by Neil Stevenson, where he kind of appears. Yeah, he's there in the culture, but as as you said, maybe his name isn't known as widely as, as we should. The tragic side of his story yeah. um, is obviously something that has, has inspired a lot of these works, and the fact that he had to... Not that he had to keep his um, his sexuality secret, because... By all accounts, he kind of didn't. He was pretty open in real life about his sexuality, but that he was punished by the state for for his sexuality. The same state that he had worked for yeah. as well, which is just so ironic, so unfortunate. Yeah. So. It's an incredible story. Let's have a listen to what Benedict thought about the character of Turing. He was a child who was fostered and had a stutter from the age of... Well, his mother came back from the diplomatic in India with her father to discover at four he had a supper. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it was shocked. But, you know, this is obviously a very sensitive child left in the care of people who weren't necessarily brutes, but yeah. weren't his actual blood parents. And he obviously needed that. And I think from that age on, he turned inwards because a child trying to make the normal social bond who had a stammer in the 30s. I mean, can you imagine the sort of, oh, the 30s or 20s, even, who had a, the, you know, the level of ostracization he would yeah. have experienced? Yeah. Of course, Benedict isn't the only person to play Alan Turing in the film. He's also played very beautifully by... Alex Lawther. And there's a scene where he's sitting under a tree at school with the young Christopher, played by... Jack Bannon. And they're discussing code-breaking. Christopher's got a book of code-breaking, mm -hmm. um, and Alan says, People talking never say what they mean. It's a very logical way of looking at it. Yeah, it places, it places the character of Alan Turing very firmly on the, the spectrum that he's he's kind of looking at other people as puzzles but it also kind of puts him at a remove from from the other people from society and that's kind of that's that is echoed throughout the film in the the conversations about sandwiches and lunch they just can't quite uh click in with with kind of everyday conversation for me that was a massive clue into understanding how this man was um from the beginning marked out sadly as being somebody who was struggling to be part of a group and a whole who would differentiate, differentiate it, who was seen as being other, different, mm. outsider, which kind of galvanized him into that into that lateral thinking, into having his imaginary world, his singular, extraordinary, but very peculiar and different focus, you know, not being a team player. And again, I think that's another part of how, how his mind started to form and, and, and obsess over maths. And then this burgeoning relationship with his boy, this unrequited love affair. Yeah. with a student who was better than him. So this burgeoning secret love fostered with a relationship, you know, uh, that, that were hinged on a love of maths and the intellectual pursuit of it and the introduction of a secret language to communicate with, which is sort of intoxicating. And that, I think, was the beginning of the idea of him living two lives, of him living a secret life. Our story sort of tried to take in his achievements as oh. a man who loved, and oh. a man who had to live his life in secret because of that. A man who then had the biggest secrets to both um, break and keep again yeah. Yeah. in the war. And then afterwards, his one secret was exposed to, to, to his ruin. Um, I mean, this sickening irony is that, you know, on top of that, and also that a man who had saved a nation and a government was then rewarded by that nation and government for his 
sexuality by being given the choice of two years imprisonment or state-sanctioned chemical castration through weekly estrogen injections. Yeah, yeah. It's just, yeah. it's, it's a torment. It's and, it is. Yeah. and, you know, you do see that still going on. Whenever nationalism rises, whether it's ISIS or the Golden Dawn in Greece or what's going on in Russia, you know, the same minorities are persecuted. Coming out of the the screening that I went to was just struck by how tragic the story is to have it up there on the big screen. Just brings it home again how ridiculous the world was and still is in part. And that's a real strength of the film, I think. I find it particularly effective at the end um, with the text um, coming up on the screen. And it says that in 2013, Alan Turing was granted a royal pardon for being accused of gross indecency. One kind of take-home message was why does it have to wait until 2013? And does that mean that there are many other people out there who will not be granted a pardon because they didn't, in the eyes um, of the government, contribute as much to society as Alan Turing did and therefore they're not being pardoned? Even though that wasn't very long ago, which is just terrible, terrible, terrible to think about. But here we are with that film being released now and there isn't, I hope, at least, there are no questions about a problem of homosexuality being portrayed in in, in in a film. I'm sure there are parts of the world, as Benedict says, where that would be a problem. But I feel like the world is going in the right direction and this film and others like it can be a part of that move. So you just have to hope that the film is not only a science communication tool, it's not only raising awareness of the work that was done in Bletchley Park, but you also hope it raises awareness that homophobia is still a problem. The film has been criticised as being historically inaccurate, so perhaps we should just discuss the authenticity of the film. If we go back to episode one and talking about Interstellar and uh, Christopher Nolan's use of, of real sets, it's quite interesting that, that Morton Tildum also wanted to in, in a sense, create authenticity. It's something that he talks about, authenticity, by going to, re- to to the real historical locations that these things happened and filming there. I mean, there's lots of different levels of authenticity. Visually, the film feels authentic. For me, there were some moments which didn't didn't ring true as a drama. There's the conflict with Matthew Good's character, Hugh Alexander, the, the dashing chess mm. champion. It's this kind of... An- you know, antagonism, which feels really kind of slotted in to to create that sort of drama within the group. So there, there are moments where it felt kind of forced. It felt like it felt inauthentic to me watching the film. So that's kind of one level. When you actually go away and start reading about Alan Turing's life or watching some of the documentaries, I mean, history is history. It's, it's the past. It's another country and all that. But f- from what we know, we've got, have got quite a good picture of what Alan Turing was like and his contribution to to the Bletchley Park team, all that stuff. So when you start to unpick it, there are there are many many differences between the life of Alan Turing and the Enigma Code Breakers, and the, and what is portrayed in the film, The Imitation Game. If you want to look into that in detail, there are some interesting articles out there. One of my one of my favourites is just called. An Alan Turing expert answers your The Imitation Game questions. That was well written. I did enjoy that, as <laughs> you said. It comes from the point of view of this guy really enjoyed the film as an entertainment. But here are some of the things <laughs> which which were different in reality. And that, yeah, that's the other level of authenticity, which which is just interesting to think about. I think. Absolutely. Mm. I think I think there's 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 definitely as that article puts it i think it's a really good way of looking at it go and see the film with your entertainment head on come away from it explore more and it enables you to do that and it's getting to a wider audience there's plenty of ways in which the film is authentic i just find it very interesting that they they've taken a story which is about a brilliant mathematician brought in to to the the circle the bletchley circle to be a part of that team and by all accounts he worked as an integral part of that team throughout that time and he helped to to perfect the machine he helped to crack the enigma code that's kind of widely documented as the story the film has kind of shifted that to a sort of lone gun 
guy, a maverick, who who comes in to the Bletchley Circle who aren't doing very well. They're kind of, they aren't working on machines, they're working in their heads and on bits of paper, and he kind of revolutionises it with his his way. Of course, he does have help from some of them eventually, but it's 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 kind of about the hero making the difference. And that shift, obviously we don't know where that came from in the film, whether it's from from the screenwriter or development executives or producers, whether it was inspired by the hero's journey. What's the hero's journey? Joseph Campbell, who wrote a very influential book called The Hero with a Thousand Faces, which is something we'll probably be talking about a lot on this podcast. You will. Um, because, <laughs> because it was a massive influence on Star Wars. Oh, we will. Oh, we definitely will. <laughs> <laughs> Loving the teaser trailer. Yeah. Wow. Oh. Yeah, it influenced uh, it spherical one. droids, I believe. That's that's where it came from. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> so this book was a big influence on George Lucas when he was writing when he was writing Star Wars, and the book is about how lots of myths kind of have similar elements, and he kind of put this all together with the concept of the monomyth or the hero's journey, and it's become one of those things that's used a lot in screenwriting and in, in story development. It was never intended by Joseph Campbell to be a sort of backbone <laughs> for a story structure. It was just, it was an interesting way to look at myths and why they're important. Um, but what's happened in Hollywood is it's become almost a mantra that good stories have to have the, the 17 elements to the hero's journey. So it's, it's almost like a kind of crib note for writing a screenplay. And definitely the imitation game doesn't have all of those elements, but there are certain elements which, which seem to have come to that, which seem to have come from, um, you know, a template of Hollywood storytelling, which has been imposed onto this true story. That's very interesting. It is very, very interesting. Uh, I, I guess that's, if, if that is what's happened, whether it's subconscious or conscious that, 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 that's, that that's what's happened, then their goal is to create a film which will be popular. And if it's seen as that's how you make a popular film, then that's possibly how it came about. As a film, I think it works incredibly well. There is one scene uh, where it didn't quite ring true for me. They've cracked the code. And they're deliberating as to whether to pass on the information to higher command. And one of the members of the team's brother is on one of the boats. As I was watching the film, it was the one moment where I thought, that probably didn't happen like that. But I didn't have a problem with it. I'd love it. I'd love it if that scene didn't have to be in there. But I feel it has to. I feel like if it's a war film, and if you think about war, and a lot of people think about war, and they don't think about the individuals, and it's just a way of enabling the necessary empathy for every single person on those boats that died as a result of that decision. That scene was an excellent way of of conveying the sheer magnitude of what they had achieved, and how significant is that they've cracked the code and what influence this could have on the war and every individual um, that is involved in the war and I think it just by inserting that scene it made it ring true it made it more believable relatable because you bring in the family element element and the emotion in. I'd love it that if we didn't have to do that but it's just it's just the way that war is thought about it's numbers it's not individuals and it I, I thought it was a really effective way of Bringing that home. If you want a more cerebral, perhaps more historically accurate version of that scene, it features pretty heavily in the film Enigma, based on Robert Harris's novel, which doesn't feature a character called Alan Turing. The script is written by Tom Stoppard, so as you would expect, it's much more about the ethics of it rather than being about a direct link to someone. This is another another point where the film kind of veers off from from the history as we know it, um, because of course, in the real history, the codebreakers were working with the military intelligence to decide which targets um, could be saved and how, and all the different excuses that they came up with, um, so that the, so the Germans didn't suspect they had a codebreaking machine. In the film, it's really the the codebreakers against the military, <laughs> to kind of, which is kind of, well, yeah, you see where they've made that change, but it's. It's maybe a little disrespectful to all the people working 
working on that mission. The first interview with Charles Dance as the as the military commander, everything felt so loaded that here here's here's Alan Turing who um, has just appeared from nowhere. Here's, here's Charles Dance who. It's basically just a military buffoon, as far as we can see. <laughs> Alan Turing kind of runs circles around him. So that conflict just felt really f- forced to me. Was it not in reality that he was a very capable mind who was also interested in co- code cracking? Absolutely. Well, that's, that I'm... came through in the, in the play, didn't it? Absolutely. I think that, and, and, and I think the family do. Have, yeah, do I think that's. With it. But the military's been celebrated in film enough, and it's about time we celebrated the mathematicians and the code breakers. Absolutely, but there were thousands of people working, even just at Bletchley Park, there were thousands of people working there. I think, I don't think there was any parts that felt inauthentic. I, um, because I just thoroughly enjoyed the whole film, it was just, you just swept along with it, and yeah. I think. Absolutely. I think if I'd gone into the film having known more about Alan Turing in the first place, then maybe I would have picked up on a few things that had been changed or a few parts that had been added for maybe added dramatisation. But I I just thoroughly enjoyed the film. If the previous incarnations of the story have been more historically accurate, great. But they haven't got the story out there quite as much as this film is doing, perhaps. Yeah. Well, I guess that's my question: is if the mission is to get the story out there, how true to the real story should it be? What if people watch this film and kind of think, "Oh, yeah, no, I'd love to read more about Alan Turing," and then they mm-hmm. start to read, for example, the biography, Andrew Hodges' biography, which mm-hmm. is being sold in a tie-in edition. <laughs> they go and read this, and they're like, "Oh, okay, that's not. Oh, that's really different from how it was in the film. Oh, that's complete." What, I don't know what effect does that have. It's it, I just find it interesting. I think I'm a great believer in that the film is a starting point. And again, you can say this also rings with science fiction that it's a starting point. And if you if the interest is instilled within you from watching the film, then go away, do your own research, and learn more about the subject. I talked to Benedict about that, and uh, it was quite interesting what he had to say. We are trying to get a broad audience, and in achieving that, Alan will actually have his story known by more people. But we're not trying to do that by desensitising the story at all. Mm. We're trying to do that by making a really good movie. And what we do is sort of, um, it, we do sketches. We yeah. do we do nice little short standards for what they do, which is write the entire textbook. We like the front cover illustration, we're like, oh, yeah. this looks interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and that, that in itself is very valuable. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, yeah. I think there is a new aspect for science. Yeah. Is we're realising how integral, important, and inspiring science is, and yeah. it actually can be something that's properly, you know, that's properly uh, part of our lives. Absolutely. Uh, and not something that's seen as being done by people in lab coats behind closed doors. It's weird, like, the more complex our lives are getting with science, yeah. I think the more weirdly, the more we need to know about it and the more intrigued we are. It's important. Where would we be without penicillin and uh, anaesthetic? Where would we be without viral controls for, for, for AIDS and, and preventative medicines for malaria? Best, best sort of investigations of that through art can, can sort of reveal that again, can, can renew our faith in what, what the positives are in science, what we can all aspire to through science. And I think it's, it's, it's both great for film culture, but it's also great for even greater in a way for education, for our understanding of the world and the people that have helped shape it. I think I think that's that's wonderful and films like like The Imitation Game should definitely be be posters or front covers leading people in to find find out more about the history. I think that's just my question of when you're making a film, of course you're gonna compress things, you're gonna dramatise things, you're gonna maybe stick two characters together and all these kind of things, of course, you've got to get a lot of history into two hours. But when when the events of the film directly contradict what we know about history, yeah, I just I'm just interested by by what that by what that means, by by what people take away from that. I think I view it the same way that I sit that I don't know other people don't, but I view it the same way that I see science and if it's if the if the science is contra it is completely cut across and isn't true I don't mind and if the history is I don't mind it's it's a more difficult thing I think for, with history uh, particularly where there's individuals involved um, but I think that they're in the I think they're in the game of telling stories and and I think this film does that incredibly well I think it's a brilliant story um, told incredibly well whether it's the actual story or not mm-hmm. um, it's close enough for me. I've got a quote here from Ina Payne, who was Alan Turing's niece, who is Alan Turing's niece. 
Uh, she says, I went, I've seen it twice, talking about the film. I've seen it twice. Ben, it was great. Benedict Cumberbatch portrayed Alan very well. He played the part with great sensitivity and it was very moving at the end. Also, Keira Knightley was very good indeed as Joan Clark. They seemed to get the relationship just right in the film and the film really did honour to my uncle and it should make everyone more aware of his immense achievements. I feel that the fact that it was close enough for his family, that says an awful lot. And I feel that as long as nobody is misrepresented in a film, as lo- then I would have to absolutely agree. That it's interesting, isn't it, that the, ble- that, that the Enigma film also j- changed it and moved characters and changed the way that characters were. What is it about the actual story that isn't interesting enough for a film? Well, yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. And I think there are many more stories to be told about it's yeah. it's a rich period it's there's loads of wonderful stuff in there so yeah. there are there are other films personally i was sort of almost hoping for something closer to the film of tinker taylor soldier spy another fantastic uh, benedict cumberbatch performance and beautiful way to to create tension from the smallest kind of points the scene where he's going into the uh, records office and has to make that substitution is oh, that's brilliant. electric from almost oh, nothing, brilliant. from almost yeah. nothing. Yeah. So for me, I guess that's almost what I wanted, but that's for me, and Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy was, was popular, but certainly not on yeah. the scale which we think the imitation game is going to be. It's a very good box office in the UK. It's just been released in the States, and it's the second highest per screen average of the year so far. Yeah, it's only been released. Isn't that brilliant? A film, a film about a mathematician. Hang on, it's only been released in four cinemas, (laughs) New York and Los Angeles. But the per screen average is really high. So whether it's going to be massive, really, you know, four cinemas. Well, sometimes they do that as to trickle it out, just to get word of mouth going, to get some buzz. Just, just to put that in context, the um, the first per screen average was the Grand Budapest Hotel, directed by Wes Anderson. Okay, they're going to roll it out across the country it's going to be big there's going to be oscar nominations at least for this film i think there's there's definitely a more arty film that (laughs) that tells tells the story if choring was an outsider if that's the story um then that can be told in different ways through through structure uh, etc of the film i kept looking at those turning dials i guess i wanted some more more style coming out of that something more i don't know more tactile something a film that for some reason popped into my head was Barbarian Sound Studio, uh, which came out a couple of years ago, directed by P- Peter Strickland, which has, it's all based in uh, sound booths, but it's, it's yeah, really rich visually and and in terms of sound, of course. I don't know, I wanted a bit more of that, getting into Alan Turing's mindset through visuals, through sound. I see where you're going with that. I'd love to see that film. Can you make it, please? Because I think yes, there's room for that absolutely. and the imitation game. Well, I'd also like to see the Studio Ghibli animation oh. with the dream sequences, <laughs> <laughs> like the the wind rises. I said last time that there should only be films about space mm-hmm. and the Large Hadron Collider. I'm going to add Bletchley Park and Alan Turing to the list. We can have those three things. So we'll leave the imitation get game there for the moment but we've not heard the last of Benedict. Uh, We had him on the phone and we had to take the opportunity to speak to him about a few other things. Benedict's played quite a few scientists actually including Stephen Hawking on the BBC, Oppenheimer, Joseph Hooker in creation, oh yeah, Dr Frankenstein and I wondered whether that was deliberate. I do like my scientists and (laughs) I think I think partly it's because of course I can never achieve anything that these men and you know characters I played have achieved. But I can understand what I can do for an audience, I guess, is try and understand the connectivity of what made them be able to achieve what they achieve. So basically their humanity. And that's really what actors do as storytellers. I'm just a curious guy. I love further learning. It's one of the privileges of my ridiculously privileged job, just being able to understand, you know, have a fuller, richer understanding of the world I'm in and the people who made an impact on it and you know also these are great stories at the yeah. end of the day it's not really that i want to play scientists or men that are clever yeah it's just that they're great stories brilliant so are, are there any scientists that benedict cumberbatch hasn't portrayed <laughs> <laughs> i dare say there are <clears throat> it's funny I, I actually asked him if there were any scientists he'd like to see portrayed and he started out by saying he wasn't really well informed enough but as you'll see he was 
I think I think the struggle, the race to you know DNA that Chris yeah, and I yeah. think those two, yeah, was definitely a film in that. Yeah, I think that's I think the Joseph Hooker or, or <laughs> is Mark Kingdom Brunel, Strada Pasquale, I mean all the French yeah. scientists, Marie Curie. Oh, blimey, of course. We need more amazing roles for women, so you know yeah. that, that would be one. So I didn't just ask Benedict. I also asked Laura and Ben, and the question is: Can you pitch to me an idea? for a film about a scientist. Laura. I was thinking about this, and from what you said earlier about you only want films about space exploration, Yeah. I, I believe I missed something, Alan Turing. Yeah, and CERN. 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 Yeah. I would... love CERN. <laughs> <laughs> Our subscribers love CERN. Yes, that's very true. That's very true. Our subscriber loves CERN. Our subscriber. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. You would only like to watch films yes. about those four topics. Yes. However, I propose yes. that you would like to watch a film about the Edwardian equivalent of space travel. I dare say I would. Go I on. So. Okay, so the Edwardian equivalent of space travel would be about Douglas Mawson. Sorry, Sir Douglas Mawson was an explorer who worked alongside Erna Shackleton, Robert Falcon Scott, Ralph Edmondson. However, he had no interest in racing to the South Pole, unlike his colleagues, and he was more interested in the scientific research. So he almost lost his life mapping unknown Antarctic regions. And basically two-thirds of the crew were scientists engaged in geological, marine and wildlife research. Their measurements that were carefully made in the face of these tragic losses and adverse weather conditions are some of the most valuable scientific data in existence. This happened in February 1913 and in 2013 scientists set off on the same expedition that they did to collect um, the same data to use as a comparison and I think that would be such a beautiful way of opening a film. Oh, lovely. How much money do you want? How much money? An awful lot because I would like to go to Antarctica. I'd you like to are dabble. you going to go and do it? Yes. Okay. I would like to star in the movie, write the movie. Have you ever been? To Antarctica. Who would you play? Who would I play? Yeah. Would it be <laughs> kind of Julie, Julia kind of thing of both timelines going on together? So it's that, you yes. in the present, Meryl Streep. Oh. Yes, I do like that idea. <laughs> I do like You'd that like idea. to be played by Meryl Streep. <laughs> I don't know about that, my dear. <laughs> or we could just bring back Amy Adams as you. There we go. Excellent. Let's do that. Ben. I don't know if I can follow that. It sounds fantastic. I'd love to see you and Meryl on screen together. <laughs> if you can get Stanley Tucci in there as well. I started thinking, we mentioned Ada Lovelace before. Yeah. Mm. Um, she had a fa- short but fascinating life. Mm-hmm. Writer of the first algorithm, working with Charles Babbage on the early computers in the early 19th century, between poetry of her father, Byron, and, and math- math- pure mathematics. Absolutely fascinating. Died at 36 or something. So, yeah, lots in there. There was uh, a film already, which I haven't seen, uh, called Conceiving Ada with Tilda Swinton, which actually sounds a little along the Julia Julia lines, that mm-hmm. there's a modern storyline and then it goes back to the 19th century. Haven't seen it. There's also a brilliant web comic called The Thrilling Adventures of Lovelace and Babbage. Have a look at that. Um, it looks like that's coming out as a book early next year as well, and hopefully that'll be a film as well. It's kind of steampunk, imagining that she lived and had these brilliant adventures okay. with Charles Babbage. Okay, so that, that's kind of been done. I thought it'd be brilliant to, to have perhaps a mini-series, not a movie. I'm thinking a mini-series kind of in the vein of Masters of Sex. What is it? Masters of Sex. Yeah. A dramatisation of Masters and Johnson, who were uh, sex researchers. It's a really good series. Who's this guy? <laughs> <laughs> you haven't seen it? It's brilliant. Michael Sheen is in it. Alison Janney. Is really? It? Yeah. Oh, wow. Amazing. I think it was on Channel 4. It's it was had a couple of seasons. So anyway, somewhere along the lines of that, uh, the story of the Harvard computers, who were amazing women who worked under Edward Charles Pickering uh, in the late nineteenth century, early twentieth century, to process astronomical data. They included Wilhelmina Fleming. They've got great names. Yeah. Annie Jump Cannon, Henrietta Swan Levitt, and Antonia Murray. 
my favourite. Cecilia Payne Gaspotchin. Who was originally from Wendover in Buckinghamshire, just up the road from where I grew up. Sounds like it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she, she moved to, to the States because uh, she wanted to be an astronomer and she thought in the UK the only job she could get was a primary school teacher. So she went to the, went to the USA, worked at Harvard. Her PhD thesis uh, was an explanation for the composition of stars in terms of the relative abundances of hydrogen and helium. Amazing. Yeah. I would she, watch that. Yeah, she appears Absolutely. in an episode of the new series of Cosmos with Neil deGrasse Tyson. I don't, don't know if she necessarily had the most interesting life. Obviously, she made the voyage across to the to the USA. I think that would be pretty interesting. She married a n- man with an interesting surname. Pushpushkin. <laughs> <laughs> you can always make stuff up as well. That's the thing with a biopic. Yeah, right? it's true. But I think this, this is going to get you, Andrew. Yeah. Um, while in school... She created an experiment on the uh, efficacy of prayer. And to do this, she created two groups. One, which was a control group, yeah. of course, that didn't pray. Yeah. And uh, after that, she became an agnostic. Because it proved that, or there was evidence that prayer doesn't work. We can put it in the film. I'd like to see the film starting with her voyage to America. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and, yeah. I feel, and then, it, and then it someone's was, praying yeah. for her. We pray that you're yeah. gonna make it. There's waves crashing. Oh God, we're praying. And then it flashes back to her in school with that scene. Oh, oh brilliant! <laughs> yeah, okay, but no, I, just... I think I think all those there's a there's a great mini series <laughs> of all the Harvard computers. I think that would be that'd be wonderful. But yeah, yeah. particularly. I think you found your next project. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You <laughs> I do, well, I can see what you're doing there, Ben. You've 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 pulled on my heartstrings, but. I'm sorry to say it wasn't a competition, and we're going to make both the films. Yay! Yay! <laughs> Just going back to what Benedict said there, I'd love to see a film about Watson and Crick, because there's that fascinating story about, as he says, the race to DNA, mm. but there's also the story of... Well, let's put it this way, they're both fairly controversial. Mm. For example, Francis Crick said, I don't respect the views of Christianity... I think we need to get them out of the way so that we can understand what this world is really about. And he went on to say that Christianity is okay between two consenting adults, but it shouldn't be taught to children. Controversial. But I'm willing to say it on the podcast. I'm not willing to say the sexist and racist things that Watson says on a regular basis. Interestingly, he's auctioning his uh, Nobel prize that he got for the DNA uh, discovery. Um, There are campaigns among uh, the scientists on social media to get nobody to bid for it um, for obvious reasons. You can't speak to Benedict Cumberbatch at the moment without talking about Sherlock. And Sherlock is often described as the archetypal scientist. And I asked Benedict whether that came into his thinking when performing that role. He's always been a hero of science, Batman, I think. And it, the, the beauty about it is that, you know, he doesn't require any magic. He's always been a modern man. And, you know, he was born out of Doyle's fascination with Bell at uh, Edinburgh University, this incredible surgeon who could tell uh, with the first meeting someone's um, uh, profession, their personal life. You know, he was, he was sort of clairvoyant, seemingly, but it was all through the powers of logical observation. It's wonderful that science can be explored with everything that cinema has to offer as an art form because you can make ideas real in a way that the written words often can't. You can help kickstart the imagination. If you can make science as magical as something else that sort of transfixes kids through the art of cinema, then you're, you're doing a great service, I think, for science. It's really important to tease people into a fascination with this stuff to go to a richer, detailed level. And that that's film, that's cinema, really. That's what I should see as cinema. I suppose films of bi- biopics are, are things that can that can tease you into wanting to learn more. And that's, I think it's a very valuable arm to our culture. We've got a job on now to make those films, so we'd better bring the podcast to a close. I hope you enjoyed episode two. We will be posting some links on thecosmicshed.com. Thank you very much to Benedict again for giving us that interview. I hope you found it interesting next time inspired by the new nasa rocket orion which launches this week as we record we are looking at apollo 13 and we have an interview 
with Apollo 13 astronaut Fred Hayes. So, follow us on Twitter, at The Cosmic Shed. Find us on Facebook, or have a look at thecosmicshed.com. That's it for this week. Hope you join us again. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye. The Cosmic Shed. Science fact. Science fiction. And everything in between. Okay, I can't remember what you said in the last bit. It was the... I can't remember. It was, uh, it, was a, it was very, very, very <laughs> it moving. Was... And saying it was basically that it was a... Oh, God. Sorry. It was like you got a philosopher in your pocket. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Carry on. Sorry. Oh. It's all falling out of my head. I would tell my ear like this. <laughs> it's falling out.